The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right. Uh, and yeah, that's true. The person's voice in that song was Daniel Schmachtenberger. So the, whoever guessed that right in the, the chat uh, won half my gift money for the for this month. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the, the STOA, everyone. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the STOA. And the STOA is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the nice edge of this very moment. And today we have everyone's favorite tr trickster and my friend, uh, Alexander Bard. And this is from uh, Alexander's uh, uh, Wikipedia profile. A uh, Swedish author, lecturer, artist, uh, songwriter, music producer, TV personality, religious and political activist. Uh, he's also a really, really good philosopher, uh, author of many books, including Digital Libido. And today he's going to share uh, a new thought, a new meme that I'm geeking out about called Sensocracy. Uh, the title is Sensocracy, Heaven or Hell on Earth. Uh, and how today's going to work, I'm going to tag in uh, Alexander in a moment. He's going to share his thoughts, uh, and then we'll pivot to Q&A. If you have any questions, throw them in the chat. Call on you, unmute yourself, ask it to Alex. This will be on YouTube, so just uh, uh, indicate that. I'll read on your behalf if you don't want to be on YouTube. That being said, um, Alexander, welcome to the STOA. You, you can unmute yourself uh, now. And let me, let me, oh, there you go. All right, there we go. Okay, hey, here we go. There we are, right? Um, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, what I'm working on at the moment is um, is actually a trilogy that I'm co-writing with my my co-philosopher uh, John Sedekvist. Um, we wrote a previous trilogy in the past called the Viturica trilogy, starting in the year 2000, finished off in 2009. And then about 10 years ago, we decided to start working on a second trilogy and deepen our philosophy further. Um, and uh, not only look at the relationship between human beings and technology, which we basically concentrated on the first three books, but actually to, to look at all of history um, in, through these new glasses that, that, that we think we have by now. So uh, we wrote first a book called Synthism, Creating God in the Internet Age. It's a very Hegelian take on the history of religion. And uh, what we're essentially saying, the opening line in that book is that everything is religion. If it pretends to be anything else, then it's probably both stupid and dangerous. So um, what we say essentially is that religion is for men and spirituality is for women. And I don't mean to degrade any one of the two. I actually think that makes perfect sense, to be honest about it. Religion is, is the way that we organize society in the sense of where we're going to go and where we're heading. Um, so we established essentially what metaphysics is and, and you know, to get over whatever nihilisms that are out there, I think it's basically just a misunderstanding of what religion is and what the word God means and what the absolute is and things like that. So we set that in the first book. Uh, so that is really the utopian book of the three. The second book in the trilogy is Digital Libido, which is the dystopian book. So this is a really dark book, Digital Libido, about say the next 50 to 100 years. And we're essentially summarizing at least the history of the West after 1945 as a tragedy. Um, and um, we mean this because phallic power was gone and, and we got confused. And that doesn't mean there isn't tons of beautiful and fantastic and amazing and novel stuff that hasn't appeared or occurred after 1945. Certainly there is, and we should take the good stuff with us and leave the bad stuff behind. But it is essentially for culture that we're in a decline uh, that we have to become aware of and enlightened uh, about. And I think this is where my work with Sedeq is ties in beautifully with Peter's ambitions with the Stoa, is, is that we're looking at a sort of a meta crisis here that needs to be solved. So uh, the libido is the dystopian book here. And we start to discuss the concept of sensocracy that I want to share with you here today in a sort of an interactive dialogue. We start to discuss and we lay out the groundwork for that concept in Digital Libido, which is a dystopian book. Uh, and we're now writing what we call the protopian final third of this trilogy that we intend to call the exodology. And an exodology is essentially a work that looks at exoduses and migrations and nomadic movements throughout history. And in this case, it's not only about moving from one territory to another territory, it's actually to move from one paradigm to another paradigm historically. So this is not only a movement in space, this is certainly also a movement in time. And this is obviously what we're doing. We've claimed in all our five books so far, and we certainly are more adamant about this than ever, Sedekvist and I, 
that a paradigm shift is going on at the moment from a very sort of Marshall McLuhanish perspective is the shift from the industrial age to, uh, to the new internet age or, or the network society, or as we would call it, informationalism rather than capitalism. And actually it's also the death of capitalism as we know it, because we have at least proven by data since 2012, lived in an attentionist world rather than a capitalist world. This, for example, explains why there's enormous deflation or repression in the world economy, because you cannot throw money at your problems any longer and thereby solve them. You actually have to figure out things that have nothing to do with money if you're going to be successful in, in the internet age. So this attentionalism is there already. And what we're really concerned with in our work is that over time, the only thing that's stable over time are triads. Uh, this is, for example, a Hegelian dialectics is always a triad. There's a negation and the negation that attacks or questions the abstraction. So the abstract abstraction can become a concretion and the concretion can then lead to the next negation and the dialectical process can be repeated. What's interesting here is the triad seem to be stable over time. It makes perfect geometrical sense. If you only have two poles, that's not very stable. You can dream about harmony and balance between two poles that never going to happen because you have to introduce a third element for something to make sense. That is why, for example, men and women don't marry each other. They go to see the priest. They add a third element representing outside society to actually make the marriage make sense. And that could then be a child, for example, later on in another triad has then gets, gotten started. So we look at triads and see if we can find triads and patterns because when things get stable, that's what happens over time. I give you a perfect example. For example, in the new book, we're looking at pre-antiquity or antiquity or the Bronze Age. I'm not a big fan of the Axial Age. I think it's generally overrated. Like any computer game kid would, would probably claim today, the Bronze Age was much more interesting because people built stuff during the Bronze Age. They just had ideas during the Axial Age. And I tend to think that actions are more interesting than words in the long run. But if you look at the Bronze Age and the establishment of the Persian Empire, for example, it lasted for over 1400 years. Whereas the Egyptians tried to create an empire only lasted for six years and ended in enormous havoc and bloodshed. Uh, and this difference is incredibly interesting because Egypt, as you know, is a one river culture. It was more or less doomed to be the culture where dictatorship was invented. Whereas Persian culture is located between two, two river systems, both called Mesopotamias or Iraqs in Arabic, Transoxania and, and what we usually call Mesopotamia as in Assyria, Babylon today, that would be Iraq in our vocabulary. But these two two river systems reminds us all the time that civilization starts not with one river, but actually with two rivers because it's in between the two rivers you have to construct a mythology where the God of one river and the God of the other river actually have a shared ancestry. So you go further back, it's called the root of the phallus. You go further back into history to discover a shared ancestry. So you can declare some kind of peace and hopefully maintain it for a while. And of course, this is what we try to do today between East and West and including the Americas and things like that. We try to look at, are there any narratives out there that would make sense to people to tie the world together today? Since we know for a fact, because of the internet live in a digitalized and globalized world. And that's from now on a fact that we have to deal with. Same thing again, we're looking at can we construct a narrative that would make sense? So what was interesting with the Persian empire was that it was built on a religion called Zoroastrianism that I've even converted to. I think it is, your religion gets better the older it is. And I mean that, <laughs> you know, if you, if you look at the development of, yeah. So I'm a big fan of Zoroastrianism and Judaism. I think Islam and Christianity have problems with the popularizations of the previous two religions. They still deal with those problems. And eventually you arrive in America in the 19th century and you then start doing Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and Scientology, it gets worse. <laughs> the further away you get from the roots of religion. So religion is certainly something that's gotten worse throughout time whereas technology has improved. Um, but if you go and look at Zoroastrianism and what it actually constructs, Zoroastrianism is essentially a reformation of paganism or Hinduism as we would call it in contemporary language today. So the Persians separate themselves from the Indians they have a shared heritage. They separate themselves from the Indians by actually the highlands constructing a new religion on top of the folk religion. They're not opposed to the folk religion. This is why Persian culture is also the, the origin of universal human rights and, and freedom of speech and tolerance. And, and you know the idea that diversity is a good thing is originally a Persian idea. And um, this comes from the fact that Zoroaster and his king, Vishkaspa, he was a reformer and a priest and the priest and the king isolated themselves according to mythology for 23 years 
before they went out through the room and said, we figured it out. We figured out actually how you can construct a system that can be imperial, gain value for everybody involved, and win in the long term. This is the beginning of imperialism. Imperialism is way older than nationalism, for example, but it's the start of getting out of the tribe and creating a larger model and a larger narrative that could work over long periods of time peacefully for a larger system. So system theory starts here. The idea of, of cherishing civilization starts right here. What Zoroaster says is that, yes, everything is process. Everything is the eternal return of the same. As all human beings have believed for millions of years, or at least hundreds of thousands of years, and Hinduism still does, but with every loop of the eternal return of the same, there's a small deviation. And if you add information to the deviation, saying you're accumulating information, which the person has just realized is what they do and all their neighbors do because they just become permanently settled. So the permanent settlement, according to Zoroaster and the Gothas, 3,700 years ago, is a radical break from nomadic life. And Zorasta basically says, I'm actually not going to be the judge between these two systems. They're just two different systems. And the nomadic system will kill the permanent settlement if it's allowed to plunder and rape and pillage constantly. So the permanent settlement has to somehow be protected through ideas and through weapons and force. Uh, so we can see what it can do. It's a very interesting take on history, isn't it? And essentially what he says is that by separating the priest and the king, aggressively from one another, the Mobed and the Shah in Persian vocabulary. By separating the two, having two different courts, two different systems in parallel, you also allow men with their limited imagination to separate mind and body, but as a collaborative construction. So mind and body are separated. And the third element to this is matriarchy. The third element to this is women women and children and the older women and the younger women who give birth to children because at the end of the day, a man can go out and conquer the world, but he doesn't, if he doesn't have any children, he doesn't have any, you can take on his ideas and pass them on to the next generation. And then there's no son. So, so without woman, that's the death of the son. That's the death of the future. That's the death of transcendence. That's the death of what, what Zorasa calls ameritat, which is what follows after your death. After you live the horvatat, the full life, you go into ameritat, which is you accept your death the fact you died is celebrated for 70 years, but your heritage passed on to the next generation. This is Zoroastrianism. That's essentially the idea. So that's the event. The son can, because of information accumulation, create a different world than the father did. And this is essentially the theory we work with all along, Sodekvist and I, because we then discuss paradigms, and then we divide history into a spoken language paradigm, a written language paradigm, a printed language paradigm, and now an interactive language paradigm, where each one of those paradigms has, is based on the introduction of a new information technology that explodes the amount of data available to human beings. The only reason we could permanently settle was because we had more information available so that we could get out of nomadic life and create a far more complex society, which is called the permanent settlement. It led to an enormous population explosion, starting in Mesopotamia, and then it became the model for the rest of the world. It took all the way into the 1960s until it conquered New Guinea too, but eventually became a universal global model. After that came printed language starting in Europe in 1450. In Europe passes, finally Europe passes a little go at getting some, you know, some, 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 some limelight. <laughs> Europe is very marginal in the world history. It's essentially just an, an annexation to do, you know, a little, small part of the Middle East to the very North where it gets cold, but they managed to, create a printing press and put some cannons onto some boats 400 years ago. They called the Enlightenment and they think they're, you know, the peak of the civilization ever since, but they're not. That's Europe. So the West is essentially west of the Gobi Desert, which is the Middle East, and the East is essentially China and India to the East. That's essentially what civilization has been for the past 5,000 years. And the most civilized thing ever invented is called the Silk Route. So what the Persians discovered that instead of having a dictator who's both the sun god and the rain god like a knot in Egypt and create the sort of tyrannical power that, that is, which will then break down. It will not break down because the tyrant is stupid or because the tyrant doesn't have power because the tyrant doesn't have will. It will break down because nobody will report to the tyrant. So an accident happens, the tyrant will be the last guy to know. Stalin died 
because no doctor wanted to go into the room where he was dying. So he, he laid alone for the last five days of his life in complete horror, then he finally died. Because everybody agreed that if you go into the room, he might execute us, but if you don't go into the room, he will not do anything to us, let him die, right? The, at the end of the day, the dictator is the most lonely character we've ever invented in any narrative. This is what the Persians understood because Surastra and Rishtaspa realized that if the priest and the king collaborate as separate entities, they will represent the separation of mind and body. But within a modest universe, then matriarchy is the third to that. Now, you can see this pattern repeated throughout history. In Judaism, it's called the three siblings, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Miriam is the older sister to which Moses and Aaron are responsible. Moses is the priest. He gets the law from God. Aaron is the chief king or king who leads the tribe, which is essentially a sect, a monotheistic sect that leaves Egypt and walks to the Holy Land or the Promised Land. And when they walk into the Promised Land, Aaron goes with them and Moses dies on the mountain. Again, we see king, priest, matriarch, king, priest, matriarch. The American constitution, the most fantastic thing with America, everything else breaks down. The only thing left in America like right now is the constitution. What is it? It's a triad. It's again, it is this triad that is the king and the priest and the matriarch. In this case, the king, yeah, it used to be Donald Trump, which is Cartman from South Park. And then you got a Corona corpse off a president, which is probably because you want as little politics in your life as possible. So good, good for Joe Biden to take on. The last thing he does in his life is to least the president of the United States. But at the end of the day, he's supposed to be the king and the priest is supposed to be the Congress and the Supreme Court is supposed to be the matriarch. You see the same triad being repeated throughout history. Now, the funny thing is that any power structure in any given society must also then be a triad over time, not necessarily reflecting king, priest, and matriarch, but rather reflecting what power is in any given society. So we need to take the king, priest, matriarch triad and then find it in all the three triads that actually establish themselves in any given society as the power structure of that society. So for stability's sake, think of a dinner party where the most powerful people in the new paradigm get together and sort of sit down at the drawing board and decide how they're gonna kill and get rid of the old paradigm's lords and get them out of the way. Of course, this for example, Versailles versus the streets of Paris in Paris in 1789 during the French Revolution. The people of Paris have learned how to read, write, and count, and the old nobility haven't cared less. So the people of Paris get tired of the fact that they read every day in the tabloid about Marie Antoinette and her corrupt fucking old elite in Versailles, and they decide to then go to their encyclopedias and find the letter G and find the word guillotine, which is essentially a new innovation, a new technology, with which they can then kill the old elite and get them out of the way. It makes perfect sense, doesn't it? But if you then read Karl Marx, who's a good and an analyst of class structure, you discover that the old elite of Versailles was a nobility that was a real power because it owned the resources, it owned the land. There was an imaginary power, what you usually think of when you hear the word power, was the king, the king and the queen, the court. And you have a symbolic power, and that is whoever dictates the narrative that is the official story this society tells about itself, which at the time was the Catholic Church. Okay, in Paris, you see establishment of a new triad, very similar. There's a real power again, and the real power here is capital. Because capital replaces land, you can buy and sell property with capital, but you can't get capital necessarily just because you got land. So capital wins. Capitalists take over and they beat the nobility because they own the new real power, which is now capital, and that becomes the capitalist or the bourgeoisie, if you use Marxist vocabulary. The next to them is the imaginary power, which is politics. So that becomes like the bloody French Revolution, but it settles down, you get Napoleon eventually. But after you've had Napoleon and we have a Napoleonic structure and a state bureaucracy, eventually we start developing a, a more wider system that we now call democracy, where people go to some kind of a square in a city and there they settle their accounts with one another and they get to vote for a parliament or a Congress or something like that. So we pretend at least the power is more evenly spread through the masses and the masses can say yes or no to a politician. Uh, politics replaces monarchy. The third one then is the symbolic power, that's the narrative. And we all know what happened with the Catholic Church. 
The Catholic Church became minor theological institutions within an academic, an academic system that was created by the church, but essentially academics eventually went its own way. We separated philosophy and religion in the West, and by declaring that philosophy was more scholarly and you know, more educated or whatever, more scientific, then we could get theology out of the way and put it at the margins. And essentially with Protestantism, this revolution is completed because of Protestantism, the new idea of individualism and atomism is then reunited again with Christian religion that gets another loop. And we have then essentially the West, what we call the West, I would just call it Europe and eventually Europe and America. Um, and the symbolic power is academics. Now, since the 1980s, the internet came along and the whole thing is repeating itself again. That's exactly why that phenomenon like woke culture right now, because essentially that none of you here probably has a friend who wants to become a politician any longer. None of you has a friend who cares too much about an academic career. And none of you has a friend who goes into old industry. I mean, none of you work with marketing, do you? Marketing to me is the perfect example of something that's dying, screaming at the moment. I think ad blockers and spam filters are fantastic because they finally tell the marketers what we think of them. You're the horse and the scums of the planet. Die. <laughs> I can't, you know, I can't, I can't wait for advertising marketing to die because we no longer need it. We have algorithms to guide us through the world. If you want information, proper information, that's why we hate ads because ads just look increasingly desperate. That is a clear sign of a paradigm shift. So old industry is dying, politics is dying, academia is dying. Now, this doesn't mean that there's some God here that protects us and has created three new forms of a new tribe that's ready to take over the world. No, we're now seeing this happening at such a rapid pace that we both are terrified of the collapse of politics. And it's gone ironic, by the way. We wrote a book called The Netocrats in the year 2000. We predicted that very soon people will you know, elect a reality TV stars president of the United States, they might as well, you know, pick a celebrity because it's got to be ironic politics from then on anyway. Politicians can only destroy things, they cannot create value. And they picked Donald Trump in 2016, they know it's kind of anti-Trump this time and probably another Trump in four years time, whatever. The politics no longer is happening. Obviously, big tech is now playing around with politics and they just got the president they wanted. So yeah, the biggest lobby in Washington DC is big tech. Big tech, what's that? That's necrocracy. That is the internet age. That is the first of the three power structures. Why? Because data knocks out capital. Data is not capital. Data is as different from capital as capital was from land. And we make a terrible mistake if we talk about da data as human capital or even use anything remotely sounding like capital when applied to it. No, it isn't. Because at the end of the day, your attention your eyeballs and your ears and what, what everybody wants to have access to, and you want to have access to another human being as well because everybody's busy these days. Uh, it's along the timeline that value is created and value is created by, by what you give your attention to. That's why I, we call this attentionalism. We don't call it dataism as you will have already suggested. I think that's the wrong word. I think the proper word for a world where data is the asset, it's not dataism, but actually it's attentionalism. Because at the end of the day, it's not the data itself, but it's the data as a way to get attention from and get attention back. And please remember here, we can't trade attention. That's why you, that's why MySpace failed, that's why Facebook is failing, because all these guys are using old paradigmatic models from previous paradigms to try to understand the new paradigm. And when you do paradigmatics, the first thing to do is don't use old models, <laughs> try to understand the new according to its own conditions and own context, because otherwise you're gonna make terrible mistakes. Facebook haven't listened, that's why Facebook will die and Instagram will die with it and WhatsApp will die with it because they still don't understand the internet. They don't understand the man versus technology relationship. So that's there already. Big tech is there already. Amazon is the biggest empire ever built. Jeff Bezos controls and rules America and half the world by now. And the only guys competing with him are Apple, Google, and the other guys out there. And, and they're Chinese and equivalents and a couple of minor European companies. Uh, these corporations now basically rule the planet. They will from now on dictate what politics is. They will dictate academia, if it even exists any longer. And they will certainly dictate the conditions for old industry. They're the profit makers. They rule the world. Okay, now how do you match that? Oops, yeah, damn. We used to have monarchy, then we had politics. And we used to have the church and monasteries and then we got academia to try to make sense of it all, like the Stoa, we try to make sense of it all. Now, 
How do we do that? Oh, dear, <laughs> we better move fast. And the word for the placement of politics is sensocracy. And the word we propose for the replacement of academia is protopianism. I should credit the people who invented these words. And Socrates was invented by some funny Russian and protopianism like Nitocracy, originally was invented by Kevin Kelly from Wired Magazine. You gotta give it to Kevin Kelly, but he's good with words, right? But what we mean with these two things is that protopianism is originally, we just cut the end point there. We're not gonna discuss that further today, but just protopianism will re-end up because the Stoa is part of the protopian. This is a protopian project, clearly. It's not academics, protopian project. And what protopianism means is, again, we go back to Zoroastrianism because Zoroastrianism, you have the eternal return of the same in the event, but you don't have any Platonist ideas or anything like that at all. Nothing is ever fixed. So with the process and event understanding of the world today, the old Persians came up with a term for what they thought was an ideal state. You would probably call it flow or something like that in American English today. But if we think of flow with something that has an output to it, so it's more purposeful, not just a feeling. But if you think of it as a feeling that has an output, a pathos with the logos, then the proper name for that would be protopianism today. The old Persians 4,000 years ago called it frasho kereti. And the word fresh in contemporary English language is from that word. Ever refreshing, an ever refreshing state of ever renewal. You wake up every day, you meditate. In Zoroastrianism, you meditate every day to have a constructive rather than a destructive mindset. This is what good and evil is. The constructive mindset, Asha, rather than Druj, means that I concentrate every morning to have a constructive mindset about myself, people around me, the surrounding world, human beings, whatever I see around me. And then I go into that mode. I've discussed it in private with Douglas Rushkov a lot because the Jews have very, very similar concepts to Zoroastrians here. So, um, Frasho Kureti is an ancient concept. We needed a new word for it. And the word for that, something Kevin Kelly come up with called protopianism. And the great thing with protopianism is that it's finally synthetically gets us out of the utopia versus dystopia dichotomy, which is again, frustrating. It's a false dichotomy. We don't have to go into stupid utopian ideas, but we certainly don't have to stay within the dystopian either because both are wrong. We can dissolute them and basically say, no, a protopian attitude to life is what we need. I think we all agree. I think the Stoa is in with us. My friends, Jordan Hall, Daniel Schmachtenberger, when we discuss these things, we're all protopians. So I think that's the ideal we're moving towards. Now, the question is, how can we then go from the current massive accumulation of data and information with stupid big tech companies run by little Platonist pharaohs like Mark Zuckerberg, who then employ thousands of psychologists to make us addicted to his machine. If that isn't evil, I don't know what evil is, right? That's Facebook. Who would want to work there? <laughs> It's horrible. So that's why he's dying, because we we're finally figuring out what it was. So the problem here is in between. It is the sensocracy. Now, of course, there are people out there who thought of this already, especially the Chinese. And uh, the Chinese are interested in Hegel and Whitehead these days. They're interested in these philosophers to think eternal change and then events can come along. But the Chinese are certainly not going for the Persian option. They don't go for a triad that reflects the fact that there's a triad in society. They're gonna go for something way more unstable and bloodier and riskier, and it's called dictatorship. China today is copying the Egyptian model. I, I thought they'd be better than that. I thought the Chinese Communist Party would be smarter than that. But for some weird reason in 2014, Xi Jinping made a terrible mistake and decided he was gonna be emperor for life for communist China. I don't think people understand what a radical break this is with history. When we just when we thought that after Mao and Hitler and Stalin, could we just accept that, you know, little boy pharaohs running the world was a terrible idea and kills millions of people. And at the end of the day, you know, it, it, the kids today get it because they, they've seen Chernobyl, right? It was my friend, Joan Rank, who directed and and wrote that series, and it's fantastic. It's not about the Soviet Union in the 1980s. It's clearly about communist China today. The kids get that. The problem with dictatorship is that if the major accident happens somewhere, nobody dares to report it upwards. It is the problem is that there's no information flow upwards in a dictatorship. When exactly the internet is this promise about intelligent flows of information in all directions. And AI could help sort that out. But the Chinese instead went for a sort of radical break through Taoism and Buddhism out the door 
stayed with Confucianism and basically we're going to have an emperor, we're going to call him Xi Jinping, and he's going to be fantastic and glorious. And they copied North Korea, which in turn is copying the Egyptian Akhenaten Atonist model. Now, this is what they've gone for. And hey, they have 4,000 deaths from the corona and America's 250,000. Bad America, great for China. America can't keep its shit together. It, 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 it's disgraceful to see it, but it's a mess. I knew when Corona happened 12 months ago when I had it myself that it would look nasty in the UK, in Brazil, and especially in the United States, because these three systems have no way of taking care of their own people. That's actually about mass deaths in America. Now, is that the end of the story? No, you still got the constitution. And you got it through Christian South who are defending <laughs> free speech these days. It's funny to see Ted Cruz being a, you know, the leader of the free speech movement in America. I'm a blessed Ted Cruz right now because he's right. I love Gab. I hate Twitter. You know, it's, it, it's fascinating to see it, but the constitution is there. And why I believe in the United States of America is because it's based on the Freemasons figuring out, educated by the French, that the Persian imperial model is better than the Egyptian one. So if you have a triad, eventually there's a triad of powers. There's imaginary power, there's symbolic power, there's real power in a structure. It has to be reflected in the power structure that controls the society, there's another triad that then goes through all the other three. The real power has to be complemented instantly by an imaginary power and then with symbolic power. And when the imaginary power is gone, that's called chaos and people hate it. They hate it with a vengeance. And as soon as it's the chaos, they will go for any dictator, any fake phallus they can have if the authentic phallus is not there. If the Messiah doesn't appear, if the Zosian doesn't appear, they will go for the fake fellas. They will go for Hitler or Stalin or anything like it. And kids in America that are playing around with the idea that America could be a dictatorship in the future. Why? Because they don't have an idea what Sasakras it could be if it isn't Chinese. So the question here <laughs> that I want you guys to help me solve and do credit to anybody who helps me solve it it's a question I repeatedly get from friends in Korea and in Taiwan, and especially in India. Thank God India cannot be a dictatorship. It's impossible to rule that way. It's essentially a 5,000 year old chaos. That's what it is. But the question is, can we have an idea of a plurality and a sociocracy? That's just, it's not moralistically superior. It's just better. It lasts better. It's more sustainable than what China is currently experimenting with, which is, Chinese communism, the internet version. And, and I think the trick here is to then fully understand what this means. It means that there has to be a sensocratic elite. So what is sensocracy? Sensocracy is sensors and senses and sense. So there are sensors everywhere and they are there's just more and more of them. So if you think you go offline because you turn off your computer, you turn off your smartphone, and you put on flight mode and you go outside the door and you go out and breathe in the park, there are satellites. <laughs> you know, since 1958, we worked very hard on covering the planet with, with, with God's eyes. You know, the God's eyes finally there. So there's the satellite there and it's the God, right? And, and the satellites look down on us. So finally there's a phallic gaze of some kind, but it's our own gaze looking at ourselves. But now we cover the entire planet with the internet. So it's like a web, we cover the entire planet. And there are sensors everywhere. Now, where does the information from the sensors go? Well, obviously, the old elite would love it to go straight into the police departments of the world and certainly into the military intelligence services. That's why Edward Snowden is a messiah. And you wanted to execute him in America? <laughs> I mean, has there ever been a more obvious messiah figure than Edward Snowden? The guy exposed the rottenness of the old system. And he basically knows we need something better than this because the sociocracy is coming and we're unprepared. And what the NSA and the American government tried to do was to try to recreate communist China in America. Then you go into Google and Apple and Facebook these days and they're full of woke people. And these woke people, they think they know better than you what your algorithm should point you towards. So your algorithm is no longer a free and open algorithm in the sense that it's a relationship between you and your friends and your family, people you care about and the occasional challenger that makes you more intelligent. It's called antagony, by the way. So you get out of the echo chamber, you know, people challenge you and when you talk to them, that makes you smarter, more intelligent. So anybody who knows those things has figured that out. But suddenly now it's not only that they try 
try to force the ads and the commercialism into the algorithms. On the other hand, they try to manipulate you now. Eric Weinstein has showed this perfectly. You try to manipulate you by, by moving these algorithms so you should think the right way. This is totally North Korean. Big tech has gone North Korean. That's how bad it is. And these are the things that are being attacked by now. So it's, it's, it's not like the United States of America is a response to communist China, but it has a constitution that claims that without power sharing and the split of power into three, we're lost. And I think we need to go back to these sort of forms or archetypes of the royal and, and, and the priestly and the matriarchal to try to find a pattern out of this. And the question that is that how can we establish a sensocracy how can we establish a technology that cannot afterwards be manipulated politically to change your mind without you knowing it? That, that to me is the key question we need to solve. And, and this is also where I differ to some differ, I think, with some of the, so the STOA, you know, the STOA collaborators. I, I think I have a disagreement here, for example, Jordan Holland and Schmachtenberger. I, I recorded a podcast last week with Jim Rutt, and we discussed it there too. I think that any attempt today to take the top-down perspective and knowing what's better for humanity and humanity knows itself and, and, and to try to nudge people. There's this new verb called nudging people. As soon as you start doing that, as soon as you start covering up the fact that you try to nudge people a certain direction that you think is desirable, you become another little North Korean propagandist. You're nothing else than that. You're despicable because you do not allow people to freely exercise their own lives in a conscious way. And this is why I'm a big fan of Zachary Stein's work and Lane Anderson and these guys who do building again, who do recult enculturement again and, and enculturation again, because the awareness of how the internet operates and the awareness of what it means that the algorithm is free and open is absolutely necessary. But we also need now to establish some kind of framework, technological framework that can't be hassled with, that not only bans the commercialization, of the algorithms, but also bounce the manipulation of the algorithm from the political angle. And I think this is absolutely key. Otherwise, we're just sitting here copying communist China like we did when the coronavirus came along. And I think that's a terrible model. It's a great model for saving lives during a pandemic. It's a terrible model when it comes to freedom and creativity. So for the protopian to happen, which will not happen in China, Communist China as a structure today can only copy and copy and copy and mimic and mimic. Believe me, I work with Chinese companies. They get stuck in the mimicking and the mimicking and the mimicking and they get stuck in lynch mobs and they get stuck in all these things that are mimicking the people do. They do not go beyond that. They do not go into the realm of the event because that takes the innovation of the novel, of the original, of the new, that radically breaks with history and creates a new value that we never had before. So I... I don't know about you, Peter, if that, that was like, you gave me 40 minutes there. Um, yeah, that was, that was brilliant, man. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm stoked uh, to ask you a few questions and I'm sure people have questions in the chat. So do you want to pivot to Q&A? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like, that's what I love. I'm working on the concept. We presented it a little bit. Our next book is called Process Event. We're working on developing Sensocracy further. And we also do this through paper and through proper science. This is a question we're being asked by the Indians and the East Asians. They're very aware of this, especially after the corona pandemic came, that they fought that as successfully as China did, but they did it with the free and open society and with their citizens involved in the process. And, and, and they want, they desperately now want to respond to the communist Chinese, especially in Taiwan. What could a Taiwanese alternative be to communist China in case communist China falls apart? What would that be? It, that would be like, what would it mean to live in a police state that you want to live in? <laughs> Mm -hmm. because that's what a sociocracy will have to be. I think the police state is unavoidable, but I think we need to discuss what could a good police state be versus an evil police state. Mm. Um, I'm curious, could you stay after the hour, like 15 minutes or more, or do you have to go right oh, after yeah. the hour? Yeah, 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 yeah. okay, cool, because because there's a lot of, we didn't really set a time, there's a lot of juicy stuff uh, to explore, I imagine. Um, okay, so start throwing your questions in the chat, uh, calling you to unmute yourself. If you want don't want to be on YouTube, I'll read on your behalf. Um, so a, a couple of questions. Uh, so in the title of the talk, you suggested uh, the words heaven and hell, and I want to double click on those. Um, and there's a philosopher that you actually turned me on to, uh, um, Jean-Pierre uh, Dupree, uh, and he has this term enlightened doomsaying. Um, so we kind of like uh, vision 
envision a catastrophe that could happen and really feel like it's real and on our bones in order to us to avoid and go the opposite direction. Um, so I, I wonder if you could do some enlightened doomsaying on this um, direction of senseocracy that China is taking and just really kind of like paint that picture for us. Oh yeah, oh yeah. This is why we wrote Digital Libido already, the book's out that's called Sex, Power and Violence in the Network Society. Uh, it's a dark book, right? I think, and you and I are part of something now called the Dark Renaissance. I, I think we need, need to prepare for, for the fact that this could be the new Dark Ages. There are two problems here, there are two dooms. One of them is the Communist China, clearly is one historically. Akhenaten's rule in Egypt lasted for six years, and then when his son Tutankhamun took over, the priest decided to kill him. So, yeah, because it was hard. Uh, and Hitler and Stalin successfully managed to copy that model and do the same thing again. I call these figures the boy pharaohs of history. They're fake fallacies. They're not proper leaders. And they always step in with the lynch mob has a kind of voice inside of the lynch mob. This is voice inside of the lynch mob, you go for the abject. So, so there's an abjection there, the Jew to Hitler, the Kulak to Stalin. There's always somebody you blame everything on. This is why book culture is scary. It does the same thing. You, you find an abject, you blame everything on the abject, and you go after the abject. That's the pagan lynch mob. That's what happens in these cultures. And then suddenly there's a voice and somebody with a costume who happens to personify the sort of shared cowardly voice from inside the lynch mob. It's called the anoject. And anojectivity is then personified and that becomes the tyrant. The tyrant is never split. Remember that? The tyrant is solid. He's one. He's a boy. He, he, he wants to be both priest and king at the same time. His greed is enormous. And he steps forward and that's tyranny. And that's what Xi Jinping has literally done in China. I cannot even make sense of whether he's Confucian or Taoist when he talks. He's trying so much to be both in one, right? That's clearly what dictators always do. And um, so we have the problem with sensocracy. We will have a problem. I think China will eventually fall apart, but it can cause a lot of havoc on the world because it's a nuclear power and, 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 and you know, say the Three Gorges Dam burst or something like that, a major catastrophe happens in China and either the Communist Party will have to go after Xi Jinping himself or Xi Jinping goes after the rest of the Communist Party. In either case, it's a bloodbath awaiting you. Chinese, China, Communist China will not last. The only thing with tyrants is they usually don't last, but it gets very, very, very bloody in the process. Hitler and Stalin killed 100 million people in Europe in between them in a few years. So we don't want that. But the problem is, even if we have a model for it, even if we go back to Zoroaster and and isolate ourselves for 23 years and admire each other when we come out of the room, but also understand that none of us can rule without the other. We cannot have a rule where religion and, and state are separate. They must be united somehow. They must be worked together because otherwise we don't have a model going forward. We cannot have an empire. And, and this insight that Zoroaster and has is what inspires me, but it inspires me to work towards uh, plural sociocracy, and I think the key here is the free and open algorithm. Whoever guarantees that is probably on the right side of history. But that's not a guarantee will work. The future is contingent. Like Hegel says, we only create necessity and insight. We don't know. And we have nuclear weapons around the planet. We have a major problem with climate change, obviously. Uh, and, and we have a problem with you know killing strangers because we hate strangers because we're just trained to go to our own tribe all the time. And, and all these problems are things we need to also address simultaneously. Uh, the internet was promising, we wrote in the synthesis book, which is kind of hopeful, it's a utopian book, we wrote that the internet has the promise of actually solving humanity's problems. And actually it's the only way we can solve the problems is by increasing technology and using interactive technologies and key. But the fact that we present some kind of model and we might use encryption and crypto to try to nail it and keep it so nobody can break it is no guarantee that it will work. It can be equally bad compared to communist China. And it certainly will be if big tech has its way. I don't think Silicon Valley is the slightest bit better than anything I've seen in China. It even scares me more because it has the pretensions of being pro-freedom, but it isn't. So, so there are two doom, doom stories here that we need to look out for. And, and the only way to get out of that is to start working through the proper philosophical, do the proper philosophical work and try to define what we set out. What is the phallic dream? What is the we set out? What is sensocracy? What is open sensocracy? What is free sensocracy? What is creative sensocracy? What is a protopian sensocracy? So protopianism can be enabled and can happen.
as the third and last leg of the autocracy. But for that to happen, we need to start these discussions now and we must not be naive. And we must watch out. If we're gonna crit critique Xi Jinping, it's precisely the desire, the little Rousseauian inside of us who wants to dictate how people must live their lives so the world can become a better place. He's a little pillar saint guy. He's a boy pharaoh guy. He's an 11 year old that wants to control the rule of the world. You know, I, I, I always say that Lord of the Flies used to be a children's book. These days, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's a holy book. The Lord of the Flies says, some, summarizes everything of the current state. And I think we need to watch out also in America right now for people who think that, well, I know how to do the world better and I'm gonna create technologies that forces people to go with my better idea because then you're back with the Knoten all over again. And you mentioned that the, the Stoa and then the adjacent kind of digital campfires are part of this uh, protopian um, part of the, the, the triad. Um, and I wonder if you have an advice for us and maybe me in particular as a steward of this place on how to proceed. Um, and then Samuel Berger's uh, dichotomy is coming to mind, dead players versus live players. I just really love this uh, coinage where dead players can only operate off a script and then live players as a person or organization that can doesn't need the script and create something new. And so I think what we're getting at here is to create live players. And we have like wisdom gyms and stuff like that at the STOA. So um, yeah, any, any general advice for us here at the STOA? Oh, you're on the right track. And that's why I love the STOA. You're on the right track. I, I, I say digital monasteries, what would that be? Okay, the future is augmented. So it's not gonna be Zoom conferences forever. And we're gonna go back and see each other in real life. And there's so many things we cannot transfer through digital. It's called silent knowledge, by the way. So there's so many things going on between human beings that actually is not communicated through this medium. Uh, but I think the reality is the future is augmented. So there'll be, everything will be intelligent. The, 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 everything will be medialized. But the problem with that is that also will collect data. And, and even if the amount of data just increases exponentially, the capacity to process that data is with AI also increasing exponentially. Uh, and the question is then what will happen when all of this data is created? Am I scared of AI? Not really actually, because AI can only be logos. And fortunately we human beings are pathos uh, and logos. So the half of what humans are, half your, one of your hemispheres in your brain cannot be replicated by a machine. And so there's, there's a great role for humans. I'm, I'm not afraid to answer the machine 30 years from now what we are, because I think that's what we work with in these books. We essentially prepare humans to answer that question. I think that can be answered. But the question is, will we naively allow the world around us to collect data about us to then enchain us into some little boy's fantasy of what we should do with, our, with life? Or will we understand that that's exactly what's going to happen if we don't get the little boy out of us? It's like Michel Foucault said correctly, every morning, get up and meditate and get the fascist out of your mind. Is there every day? So I think that's fine. I think the digital monasteries movement today means get a large space somewhere in the countryside where you've got cool air around your head and where it's not too expensive to buy a property. Then get a small one-stop shop in the urban environment where most people live. I think the future is to go somewhere at five o'clock in the afternoon and have a drink and have your Bodo's injection <laughs> and have the therapy and have the gym and have everything. You know, can somebody please fix me? <laughs> as the biggest market ever. <laughs> That's the future of the therapy industry. And I think in a good way, that is five o'clock in the afternoon, instead of drinking the beer in the bar and getting a beer bully, or you know, having white wines with the girls and gossiping and then have your ego crushed and then go home and cry. No, <laughs> get out of those misfortunes, get out of bad matriarchy and bad patriarchy and go back into going to somewhere, fix yourself at five o'clock in the evening. And then after you started fixing people, you can fix other people. You can become that sort of super therapist that we're looking at at the moment. But I think that's going to happen in urban environments. I advise nutrition companies. I advise gyms. I advise therapists. I advise anybody who works on improving people's lives to basically start collaborating. I think it's a fantastic idea to have a one-stop shop in your own block where you live in the city, in your smaller apartment, but then also have a larger presence, like in Canada and Sweden, where you do not live, to have a larger presence in the countryside where you can actually send people off for weeks or months to do their own self-improvement processes and for people to just be able to go into deep studies, turn off the machines and just study, 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 study to really truly understand the complex uh, phenomenon of life. Super cool. Um, 
Very so compact. when are you going to up in the Stoa in Manitoba or something like that? You know? <laughs> With a huge ranch that's all yours, you know, next to a lake. Yeah, step step two. Um, all right, let's pivot to the, the, the chats. Uh, Evan, uh, you're up first. Thank you. So this has been super interesting. So um, <clears throat> you're asking in some ways for us to uh, contemplate the positive aspects of sensocracy. Um, what might be possible there that's not possible under the current circumstances. And the first thing that occurs to me there is the possibility for the recording of what you might call total history. Um, so instead of historians having to laboriously reconstruct and speculate as to certain pivotal events that happened between major figures or the way something actually went down, you'd instead have recordings of this from multiple perspectives, multiple spectra. And so I'm, I'm just curious on any further thoughts you might have about how sensocracy might positively influence the craft of the historian. Excellent question. So you got two things here. Storytelling is always mythos. That's, again, that's Hegel's great insight. The only way we can tell a story is through mythos. That's exactly why mathematics can tell a story. So logos is what you're talking about here. Logos will increase massively. The great thing for anybody working with history today is that we can throw a lot of guesswork out of the door and get a lot of proper facts in. That, that actually is for everything up until now. So everything you do from now on will also be remembered. So digital, the real digital that's really going to happen in the 2020s, we haven't even started to com you know, comprehend what digital is yet, but the real digital is going to happen. Now it's like, it's a, like a big wall that's just rolling over us with data and facts. You can't deny things that have happened to you logically, but that's half the story. The other part is pathos. And that is exactly what Hegel says that we constantly rewrite history. And the reason why we need to rewrite history is not because we get new facts. And, and oh, we thought this before, but the facts actually are that this was wrong. So we throw that out as fake history and here's genuine history. No, we can only do that with the logos element. That's exactly what natural science is a great, I'm, I'm totally opposed to social science. I think that's it. There are no social sciences. It's just propaganda shit or whatever, really bad stuff. Psychology should be a natural science. It's not a social science. Natural sciences are sciences in the sense that logos is always tied to the natural world, including human beings as natural creatures. But the cultural aspect, the mind aspect versus the life aspect of what it means to be human is fundamentally pathical. And, and the pathos cannot be turned into logos. So when we say that we rewrite our history, it is because we write who we are now. And this is why we talk about the root of the phallus in our work to differentiate it from history. And the root of the phallus is essentially how you reconstruct your own lineage of not only your biological lineage, but also your lineage of ideas. Because once a new technology, for example, suddenly emerges and creates an event, then we have to rewrite history because, oh, oh my God, now that's what's important in life. That's what's important to us. That's what's important as we plan for the future, how to have some kind of order in the chaos so we could optimize our chances of having the kind of life that we dream about. Okay, that's walking forward. That's walking towards the promised land. That's what we talk about exodus and exodologists in our work. So how could we possibly walk into the new territory or into the new and make that a better world than what we had before? Now, that's exactly what, why we can rewrite the history of logos now with data. And we can probably even with crypto fix it and say, no, this is when this guy lived and this is when this guy died. He had a body. <laughs> and even if his spirit survived or whatever, we don't care. But the body itself, had birth this day and died this day. It's an undeniable fact. Now that's settled once and for all, we don't have to argue about it any longer. But the meaning of that life and what the meaning of that life is to us today and what the meaning of the life might be to our children who will then try to kill us and rewrite history is pathical. And this is why when we work with narrative, we always use these three terms and we use them in a dialectical sense that whenever when there's too much logos in the world and too many Platonists running around the place like big tech in Silicon Valley, you need to put pathos in there, okay? Through pornography and a sense of humor and really Shakespearean theater, anything you, you don't want your kids to see is pathical. Throw it in the mix and, and probably then that will solve things because then they will have to come back with a new better mythos and only the mythos can guide us forward. Any follow-up, Evan? No, that's a lot to chew on. Thanks. All right, Jared, you had a question. Sure, yeah. Uh, in short, um, 
what would you do if you had a framework to allow people to make sense-making AIs? So, and by that, I mean AIs that could derive meaning from human language via a shared ontology. So a common understanding of the structure of information among people and software agents. It's kind of a loaded question, but what would be the first steps that you would take if you had that? Okay, so AI is at best like a Chinese manufacturing worker. It mimics and mimics and mimics and mimics, and it looks eerily like what we do. I used to be a songwriter, and uh, I've heard uh, AI written songs. And they all sound like really bad Max Martin copies written by terrible Germans. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> they have the eerie quality of, yeah, I heard this before. It's not as good as the stuff that I heard. It lacks spirit. Very Hegelian, it lacks spirit. Yeah. Oh, a machine wrote it. Oh, of course. It's, it's like 90% and 90% and 90% and 90%. It's never 80%. It's always 90%, but it's never 100%. It's never brilliant. It doesn't touch you. I don't see how AI can create art. You can only mimic art. So the mimicking, this is exactly why Rene Girard is so big these days, because people are finally realizing that we need to understand history through lynch mobs and mimicking and the tensions that come out of the mimicking that human beings do. And, and most human behavior is mimicking and most human, I, I, we mimic, mimic each other's desires as Girard says, and that creates tensions. And then we get the lynch mobs throughout history. And, and we try to construct major religions to try to tame these forces. So, so they don't cause too much havoc on the world all the time. But at the end of the day, AI cannot do anything else. It should not be expected to do anything else. My, my response to what AI will do is that it will both do absolutely amazing things where we go like, wow, but it will also be so incredibly stupid. What? AI cannot be horny? <laughs> All right, AI cannot crack a joke. <laughs> AI can solve a problem, but not have a fun new question. All right, why? Oh, because that comes from the pathical hemisphere, because of, it comes from the continuum rather than the discretion. Because with AI, you do zeros and ones. And as long as there are no machines out there that have a more organic way of functioning where, you know, the continuum, the oscillation actually is driving it, uh, and, and, and the ambivalence that goes with that, and the dialectics that comes out of that, um, yeah, that, that's why we read Hegel these days. We read Hegel like an organic. We read Hegel like he was precursor to Whitehead. Like it's the organic aspects of his pan dialecticism that is so interesting these days. And this is why we go back to the narratives and talk about the three narratives, especially American culture is completely obsessed with the opposition between logos and mythos, the way Chinese culture is obsessed with yin and yang. But hey, pathos is there all the time. It, you know, that's why you can't make a pornographic movie and a movie in the same movie because <laughs> you can't have theater and pornography in the same movie because they are clearly to the human mind very, very different spheres of understanding. And this is the funny thing with machines. They can't do, do pornography. That's what they can't do. So I, for me, that's, that's the answer to the question. I don't know if if I answered it properly, or, or I answered it from my best understanding of what you addressed, I think. Okay, uh, I guess the only thing I would add in there is what if we thought about it as giving language to AI? So in the same way that when humans had language, they were able to self-organize and do things, tell somebody I'm gonna go do here and you do this. What if we had a system where AIs could derive meaning from language and like oh understand oh, oh yeah yeah that that's the okay. easy part that is logos oh, yeah. you know what you know what what you know what ai does when you got to translate english to french it invents a third language for itself right because it's what our brain does so we we, we will now increasingly this is wonderful we'll increasingly see how ai when we reflect as a studio ai teaches us tons of shit about our ourselves and actually at least how talented and brilliant people actually work <laughs> you know yeah. their minds function and that could, of course, increase the pathological element that is human creativity. Certainly, yeah, I, I think we all agree on that. That machines do help us to, to embrace a, a further protopian creativity and a whole new level of creativity that comes out of it. Yes, absolutely. 
agree on that. So I think when it comes to language, that that is exactly what machines do. And but they they formalize language in a way that is impossible. I'm very critical of analytical philosophy because I think analytical philosophy is a waste of time. I think analytical philosophy in itself, despite its achievement in the 20th century, didn't got to nowhere because it tried to it mistook language for being as logos as mathematics is. Mathematics is pure logos and language is logos and pathos. And that's exactly why no analytical philosopher ever wrote a single piece of poetry. Because they were just little plays on his boys trying to, I, let's control language, let's formalize it. So language will exactly express how reality works. Well, that's just zeros and ones. And quantum mechanics just threw that out the door. Oscillation is everywhere, everywhere in nature and everywhere in culture. So ambivalence is everywhere. So no, it didn't work. It didn't work at all. The pathos was there irritatingly. And that is very irritating for 11 year old Platonist boys who don't want to think that there's a world beneath their own throats. They hate the fact that violence and sexuality reminds them constantly that there is a man who wants to you know, grow up and <laughs> conquer the world, have will to power. So the, 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 it is the Platonist fantasies in analytic philosophy that eventually killed that whole discipline and made it so not interesting and so not able to understand and explain the current meeting between man and computer. Awesome. Um, all right, let's go to David. Hey, good morning. So <clears throat> I, I um, listen to this. I'm wondering if it's possible to, if it's, if this seems like a right thing, and it sounds like it is based on what you've said. Um, if we map pathos as the master and logos as the emissary and the master and emissary model, um, then mythos perhaps is the synthesis of the two hemispheres, something like that. Yeah. And, and if that's the case, then that gives us some guidance about how we might look at the feedback loops in the development and implementation of the ecology of practices, how we do this. And, and, and the way of this is I recognize the logos is addicted to the pornographication of, of the world and trying to get to the answer, get to orgasm as quickly as possible. The pathos really understands that it's teasing the logos into discovering new ways it's leading it by the nose into new new aspects so yeah so that this this mythos this mythos is a new architecture of thinking about how do we get this practice and then ai is, is an interesting way to look at the feedback look at ourselves in the mirror as we're going through this process is that is that a good way to map that from your perspective oh wonderful yes i i i do a, a podcast with andrew sweeney in paris and we have a friend called thomas amarek who's a who's a, who's a belgian um, uh, he is actually a Belgian professor of artificial intelligence more than anything, but he's, he's a great guy. And we've, we're actually exploring what if we could add Tantra to Nietzsche and Hegel, because Tantra and Sutra is the division between these two in Eastern philosophy. It's very, very simple. It starts with cherishing investments. So if you don't come now, something better will come out of it. So don't come. So don't eat this right now. Put it in the earth and let it grow for six months and you'll have a hundred times more of it. That is what Tantra is. Tantra is basically teaching people that no, no, wait, 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 wait. Postpone the reward. And if you postpone the reward, it will get better and better. For men, that means separate mind and body, separate war and hunt, and maybe there will be a sexual reward at the end of the day and then go back into the same circle, circle again. So yes, this is absolutely key. So the trick here is to understand Hegelian philosophy as pathos versus logos. They are never reconciled with one another. They cannot be reduced to one another. They're in constant conflict with one another. That conflict is temporarily solved through mythos. Then we have a mythical understanding of the world. Oh, the world makes sense. You know, when you, when you try to be sober, <laughs> you come off the drugs and the sex and whatever, and you try to be sober and there's a, you know, a Monday ahead of you and you gotta go to work or whatever. That's when you need to be sober. And you have a mythical idea and understanding of the world. You stay with that model for as long as you like, or as, for, for as long as you can, until the cracks in it. And the way it phenomenologically works is that if there's a crack in it, you probably throw that crack somewhere underneath the carpet and try to ignore it because there might be cracks. But as soon as you have a second crack and the second crack reminds you of the first crack and they look to, they seem to be similar, like if they're almost exposing another system beneath, then you pay more attention to it. When the third crack appears, you skip the old model, you need to create a new mythos. And that's why it makes sense to us as a human being to go back to the pathos and the logos. And at least for men, I'm discussing this with female philosophers now or anthropologists because they're fantastic because they look at it completely asymmetrically. But at least when it comes for men, the separation of mind and body here is central. So we all have pathos and logos and essentially in the fundamental sense, the two hemispheres are that. But we have an expertise of pathos and we have an expertise of logos. 
That means Nietzsche's mistake is to understand will to power as the way towards the overman. Like one of my students said, why aren't there two overmen? <laughs> Why is he lonely? <laughs> That's a very, very intelligent question. Because your brain is split in two halves, so there isn't one you, right? The self is basically how you try to balance these two things in an eternal conflict that's never solved. It is no solution to it. And you, you temporarily solve it with the mythos. And that's exactly what happens here when we look at men as a whole, when we look at the male collective, we look at the priest as the will to intelligence, which now AI is doing. It is the priestly function that AI is doing, but it's not doing the royal aspect, the chief chieftain. The royal aspect is the body, not the mind, it's pathos. It can't do that because there's no, there's, no, there's, no, there's no will to transcendence, as we call it, within pathos. The will to transcendence, there's no will to transcendence to a machine that operates zeros and ones, no matter how fast it operates that. It's not suddenly gonna come out of it because it's completely different from the will to intelligence. So the priest collects all the data, like we talked about here, but all the data of history, all the data of history up until now is collected by the priest. The priest is bored in the confession booth all the time. He knows everything that goes on in society. That's his job. And he's got the monks and the nuns as his army to make sure we know shit, libraries, collection of data, priestly. But then he presents it to the chieftain. The priest must never aspire to be the guy from the future. The guy from the future is the chieftain, his pathos, his body, his, 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 his horny guy like the Germans has. And he's funny and, and, and he wants to conquer the world and he wants to transcend. And therefore in Persian history, the Mobid was never allowed to put one of his sons in charge of his job. What they did was that the, 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 it's always the king's first son who becomes the next king. And it's the king's second son who becomes the next priest. So the priest resigns. Same thing with the Mithraic orders, Roman army. The priest gets the top spot by resigning from heritage, by resigning from transcendence. He clearly is non-transcendent. He says, nope. I will do everything. I will do the necessity according to Hegel. I will do everything up until now and the Amur Fati. And once you declare the Amur Fati before the priest, the priest goes back and hides in the woods and it's time for the chief to step in to lead us towards the future. <clears throat> and this fundamental separation of transcendence and intelligence is what's really important now when we try to dissect this and discuss sensocracy and respond to the Chinese because all these AI people out there, both the Chinese and the Americans AI people, they don't, re they don't understand that Logos and Pathos are two different narratives. They don't understand that there's no, there's no peace to the Logos by killing the Pathos. That's like cutting off your dick and think you've achieved something. Don't be a machine, be human. Any, any follow-up, David? That was a mic drop moment, so I don't know if any is needed. <laughs> yeah, I have one, but it's off. It's off on another tangent. It was trying to bring in the comments, and I'll I'll save that for. I'm gonna I'm gonna work on that one a little bit. No, no, please, please, you're great, you're great. I love your questions. Please, please pass it. Have it. So the it. so the the notion here is that um, I've been talking a lot about the uh, the evolution and, and um, emergence of the commons as a self reflective body. Right now, we moderate through state and and market. And they both are, are have become very much um, in that pornified version of, of something that's, that can't actually do it. And in a way, it's teasing out, we're going to have to reawaken the uh, inner authority of the commons in order to allow the kind of murmuration. And this is, this is again, the importance of Verveke's notion of the ecology of practice. So we have to reawaken. I can't rely on any representative to enact on my behalf. I have to act on my own behalf. And the commons can't quite see itself yet, but we're right there. What you're naming is exactly that challenge of how do we do that? And that's why I love what Peter's doing here with the Stoa, because this is like the birthplace of the collective feeling itself into, in, into self-reflection, into, into, into the embodiment of the, of the commons collective. Yes, but let's not be too naive here. Okay, this is called paradigmatics. It's a very American word, by the way. Paradigmatics means that the paradigmatics is wrong. The state is now trying to manipulate us by controlling the algorithm. The market is trying to manipulate us by corrupting the algorithm. We don't want the ads in there and we don't want the political propaganda in our algorithms. We want them out. 
that's what we clearly say no to communist China because communist China is only those two things. It's, it's, it, it's the absurdity of the supernova of the state and the supernova of the market taking over your brain and taking over your mind. That is the communist Chinese strategy. We don't want that. We clearly don't want, we prefer anarchy over that. We'd rather die than have that. We, we oppose to that. So we can start working on the free and open sensocracy and the free and open algorithm. I work with hackers all the time because the hackers out there are the heroes of the world today. While the American election was going on, 40,000 Taiwanese hackers tried to help kids in Bangkok and Hong Kong create revolutions. That is the real thing that's happening right now. That's the real revolution. It's not in America. It's clearly happening in East Asia right now. So I'm totally with you on that one. But let's not be naive here. If the state and market now are falling apart, the old paradigm is gone. Those are vacuum. There are two vacuums here. And the vacuum of the state is sensocracy and some kind of absurd, vulgar, Platonist version of that state is what big tech in California and what the Chinese communists are trying to, to, to create at the moment. And they will succeed if we don't stop them from it. We need to create alternative answers and leave their platforms and get out as soon as we can. So that, that is part of it. But, and the market is the other one. And to me, that's just declaring capitalism is over because it is over. It sounds, it, sounds, it sounds horrible to say, considering that so many people are suffering from poverty around the world. But what I mean by that is that capitalism is reduced to a lower level the way land ownership and farming and agriculture was reduced to a lower level when industry came along. It's the same thing. It's, it's still there, but eventually the countryside was turning to a bacon factory, the new model one. It's the same thing here. Attentionalism will eat capital. So attention is everything and every value. And that's exactly why they want your eyeballs and they want you to, co to corrupt your eyeballs and they want to manipulate their eyeballs. And you need to be aware of this and create a new enlightenment that says no. This is what we talk about here. We need to create a new creative, a new commons, right? But mind you, I cannot be a Marxist yet. I must be a Nietzsche. I don't believe at all we can create some kind of general awareness of this and get everybody in the people with us. I think we have to be humble enough to understand that this is the creation of a small new elite. It, the people who ran around in the streets of Paris didn't try to get all of France behind them. They knew that they could read and write and count, but they knew that the peasants, the poor peasants of the serfs of the French countryside could not. So on their behalf, they walked ahead. That's what I'm talking about, an exodus here. Exodus to the digital is a small elite of netocrats where Peter and the Stoics is trying to create a protopian elite. And I'm trying to just basically get this autocracy set so the protopianism is even possible. Because otherwise, the protopian institutions that we try to create, the protopian academies and monasteries and everything we want, and you know, this dream about having a big place in Manitoba countryside, we can all go and go deeper into things and loving life and be monks and nuns or whatever. For that even to happen, if, if that's not going to be banned and we're going to be persecuted for even trying to do it, we need to get this free and open sociocracy done first. And that's why, to me, this is the acute problem I'm trying to solve with you guys in collaboration. Put the term out there and say that, what does it mean to live in a free and open sociocracy? What does ironically mean to live in a good police state? What would that be like? And what would it be like to be an elite that is allowed to conduct its exodus out of the old paradigm to create a new paradigmatics that says, this is what it means to be a digital augmented human being living in collaboration with AI in a way that we never thought we could imagine before. And the name for that is protopianism. How does this um, interface with, you know, Jordan Hall, Daniel Schmachterberger's Game A, Game B, uh, this triad, it seems like the, the hellish version you're describing is like the hellish version of, of the end point of Game A, and then maybe the a healthy version, if you will, is a uh, gesture towards Game B. It is very, very difficult because it, it, it's, how do you create a state that is so small that it's optimal? without getting too big and having too many boy pharaohs trying to run the show. I think the welfare state is doomed for all kinds of reasons. Uh, but I also don't want these people who call themselves environmentalists now to walk into the arena and say that, well, just because we were dystopian and said the world will go down due to climate change, we're now gonna force sustainability as a code and absolute everything human beings do. And therefore we hate cars and we hate roads and all kinds of stupid ideas they come up with. It, it, they have no sense of the future. They have no sense of solutions. They have no sense that solutions in the future will also affect how we live today. 
So for example, here in Europe, the big dramas about cars and roads and things. And, but everybody said the car industry knows that every damn car will be electric 10 years from now. Half of all cars sold are electric already. So why do you worry about diesel engines? God, it's, it's, the problem is that if you put children in charge of dictating the future, you create horror. And that's what constantly happens now when you go and ask the masses what kind of future they want. Or possibly even worse, you ask a boy pharaoh, self-appointed boy pharaoh, what kind of future he would like. Because that's even worse than what the mass, the mass at least know that leaders can cause havoc and probably say no to most things at least. But the boy pharaoh will say yes to all his plans and how he wants the world to be like. And at the end of the day, the boy pharaoh wants him to impress his mom. And he wants to keep the world the world of boys and girls. He's terrified of men and women. And he's certainly terrified of the gods to come after the men and the women. So he's terrified of, of moving into a, an adult state. This is where I agree with Jordan Peterson, why he's important and why our shared motto is adultify the world. After 1945, we infantilized our culture massively. We started worshiping youth and children and we had youth worship instead of Western worship. No culture ever did that before in history. The fact that we talk about wisdom and return to wisdom, it's like a given. There has never been a culture before ever in history that declare that you peak when you're a teenager and everything then is downwards with Botox or whatever. That's just ridiculous. And young people are reacting to it aggressively. They go for mentorships now. They, they, it's like all these 20 years, they go after guys like me, 50 hours, like, can you please mentor me? He says, I can't mentor tens of thousands of guys, but I can at least tell you about what you could possibly do and show you direction and then we create a movement. And you know, if you can't have an older person guide you, find five people your own age, because at least if you're five people 20 years old, you're 100 years in between you. And that's essentially what wisdom is. It's just life experience. Right? So this is what we're doing now. That's why there is a return to wisdom. It's not, it's not even conservative. It's like a, it's like a retribalization to have some kind of platform for which people are comfortable enough to address their weaknesses and work on them. You can call it retribalization because tribe is the only thing people can orientate themselves according to the works. We call it subcultures when we're aligned. Then you can get out of the echo chambers and you can take on challenges and maybe you can get more intelligent in that process. But that, that's where we're at right now. It's so much good stuff, um, but we do have to land this plane. Uh, Man, you got you have to come back, uh, Alexander. <laughs> you, we could maybe sense make a residence or something. This is so much good stuff here. People were requesting in the chat. Um, but thank you so much for, for coming today. Sure. Thanks a lot. And, and stay in the dialogue. I'm around. Uh, and you and I, Peter, we set up a network called the Intellectual Deep Web a couple of years ago. It was essentially respond to Jordan Peterson who went on the world tour. And, and we said, we'll take care of the students. We'll take care of all the fun, you know, clever young people that will come along and need to find a place where they can have a dialogue with one another. And, and we have the Intellectual Deep Web, this simple mailing list and Google groups. And Peter and I started it. It's a transatlantic effort and it works. It works wonderfully. So for you guys out there interested in keep on in staying with the dialogue and together develop these ideas, I'm perfectly happy to co-credit anybody who comes up with ideas that I can use for my books. That's all happening in real time, by the way. I don't do footnotes. I, I write it in the text itself. So I want to I want to co-develop these ideas. We don't have a finished, clear idea of free and open society. I know the Koreans are working on it. I know the Taiwanese are working on it. The Indians are certainly working on it because it is also, of course, the model towards protopianism. Because if you ask the next question, which is what does it mean to be, for example, a successful technological entrepreneur in the future, that is to be a protopian. And are protopians even allowed to exist in the future? Well, how do we how do we make sure that happens? Well, we gotta we gotta create a system of free and open sociocracy where we value novelty and we value emergence as central themes. Otherwise, we're bound to mimic and repeat the past, and we know where that ends up. Right, right. Oof, delicious, delicious stuff. Um, I do recommend everyone uh, join the intellectual uh, deep web forum that Bard and I created years ago. It's still active. It's, it's a lot of uh, great uh, exchanges there. Um, yeah, and you know, I'll circle back via email to invite you back on. Maybe as a, a longer term series, we can have something interactive with maybe both the forum and then the Stoa. Um, but I'll make some closing announcements in a moment. But uh, my friend, again, thank you so much for coming to Stoa today. Uh, it was a lot of fun. 
we have an event in um, about 40 minutes, uh, high pitch. Uh, all the ladies at the, the Stoa, Benita Roy, Nora Bateson, more, they have this sort of like, you see a wee space forming with them in a conversation. It's quite beautiful and very embodied. Um, and that's uh, part two out of a four part series. You can uh, RSVP there. And we've got tons of events on the website. Uh, we have a Patreon and Substack, so check that out there. So again, everyone, uh, thank you for coming to the Stoa today. And we'll listen to some Danish Magdeburger singing on our, our way out. Thank <laughs> you.